Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Weston Spratt, who serves as Dean of Juilliard's Preparatory Division and is a trombonist in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. Weston, welcome to the show. Hey, Aaron, good to be here. Thanks for having me. And, and of course, I would be deeply remiss if I did not also share that Weston is a recipient of the Sphinx Medal of Excellence uh, just from this past year. So congratulations on just all of your extraordinary success, your leadership, uh, and the role that you play in the field. Um, and I thought I'd really just delve right in kind of on the you know Juilliard prep division side and to just kind of ask uh, two things. So one, um, can you just kind of share the scope? Uh, because obviously everyone knows Juilliard and Juilliard's got a prep, but what is the scope of everything that falls within Juilliard prep? And then beyond that, how are things right now? Where, where are things at in terms of uh, what you're able to do, you know, uh, remotely or in person and how you see that going? Yeah, so the Juilliard Preparatory Division is actually an umbrella for two programs. We have the Juilliard Pre-College, which is very much a global program for students between the ages of 8 and 18. We have students from the United States, but also from China, Korea, Japan, Canada, all over the world that come to study at uh, the Pre-College. And we have about 300 students in that program. Uh, it vacillates between 300 and 320, depending on the year. And students come in every Saturday, and they have basically a full conservatory curriculum in one day if you can imagine. So most students in that program are getting a private lesson, chamber music, uh, music theory, ear training, some type of musical elective like group composition or group piano. They're also playing in large ensembles like an orchestra or, and, and singing on a chorus. And then they have studio class as well. So all the things that a music major in college would have, they have during that day and it's pre-college. We also run a program called the Music Advancement Program, which is a local program that's geared towards serving students who are uh, historically underrepresented in classical music. Uh, and we serve students who are from the New York tri-state area. And that program has about 70 students in it. And the level is intermediate to advanced. Uh, so we, we're not training students who are beginners, but we're training students who have a couple years of experience and are looking to enhance their musicianship and have a pathway to even higher musical learning. Uh, and that program, actually the curriculum is, is quite similar. Those students start every Saturday at 8.30 in the morning with a class called, with a, yes, exactly. But they, they're there and they're excited about it with a class called a uh, Map Rally, which is a community building class where students learn about all different types of things, how to organize my practice schedule, how to create a calendar, how to be a good colleague, um, any number of things that you can think of. And they also participate in, in lessons, music theory, year training, ensembles. And at the end of the day, every student ends with course. So all of our students in that program start the day together with all of them in MAP Rally, and they also end the day together. Uh, and those programs run concurrently on Saturday. So all in all, we're, we're, we're dealing with um, about 380 students. And of course, the parents and guardians of, of all of those students and a faculty of about 150 people and a staff of nine or 10. So uh, it's, a, it's a very busy, robust, exciting program. There's a lot of joy in the space, uh, which is one of the things I love about it. And to answer your question about where are we now in the midst of this pandemic, um, really, really thriving, if, if, if I can dare to say that, that despite all the things that have happened over the course of this past year, uh, it's been a really successful year. There have been a lot of silver linings uh, that have resulted from the pandemic uh, and also the conflation of the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement have gotten institutions thinking about a lot of different things. So we've been commissioning works by, by composers who come from traditionally underrepresented categories. Uh, all of our students participated in a course called Underrepresented Composers Expanding the Canon and have learned, been learning about lots of different music. Uh, for our students who have remained remote, we have had um, different courses for them to kind of take the place of being an orchestra. And we've had great guest artists, many of whom you know, 
Chichu and Wanoku, Stephanie Matthews, Kelly Hall Tompkins, uh, Rufus Reed is coming in, a, is coming this Saturday. And a few weeks from now, Peter Archer, who is inspiration for the movie Soul, is coming to speak to our students. Um, and in the meantime, we've actually been able to do some work really safely in person in the building. And we've been doing that since October 31st. So now on any given Saturday, when you come into the building, we have eight or nine in-person ensembles that are rehearsing, albeit in a distanced uh, fashion with lots of protocols and building entry requirements uh, with masks and bell covers and things like that. But our students have been playing live and in person and, and doing recordings as well. So it's um, we're simultaneously running an in-person program and an online program. And um, so far, knock on wood, it's been quite good. Well, that's awesome because so many institutions, right, have had to just be fully remote and uh, and all of that. So the fact that you've been able to bring back that that in person component, uh, which obviously is so valuable, especially for for young people, um, and kind of as you think about and and you're leading these efforts, when you you know project out a couple years, you know pretty much everyone who wants to be is vaccinated. You know it's not the the urgent issue that it is currently. Do you envision that some of the things that you put in place this year would remain? In other words, will there be any kind of online or digital components that you think are actually of value moving forward? Or do you think you'll kind of be logistically back to where things were? Oh, I think there's definitely gonna be things that we carry forward. In fact, we were having a faculty meeting last night and that's one of the questions we asked everybody. What are the things that we've learned during pandemic times that we want to keep moving forward. Um, and I think there's a certain degree of connectivity that you can have online that everyone is, is a little bit closer in some ways, not closer in physical proximity, but you know, every people are more available sometimes by doing that. So that's an element to keep. Uh, it's easier for teachers to feel like they're able to check in with their students on a regular basis, as opposed to only once a week, maybe that midweek check-in that you wanted to really have, even if it was just for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, there's an avenue for that now. Uh, the ability to bring in guest artists from all over the world is something we would love to keep. You know, it's, it's in previous times we're thinking about scheduling and getting someone to fly here and all those other things. And we can have a really wonderful conversation just like you and I are having now at any time with someone who's in Germany or Japan. So, so we should be keeping that. But even bigger than just uh, taking advantage of technology, I think one of the things that's happened over the course of this year is because the in-person experience has been so limited in some ways, organizations, Juilliard included, have been forced to think really creatively about what different things can we do and what other things can we offer in the curriculum that are going to keep students really engaged. And so that's brought about some different electives and things like that, that we've been able to offer our students that we probably would have not thought to offer in previous years, because we've been searching, how can we make sure that students still feel interested and engaged in the material? And so different classes that we didn't have before were suddenly part of the schedule and kids love those classes. Okay. So we have to find a way to make sure that we keep those and they're part of what we do in the future. Right. So I want to kind of switch gears a little bit to kind of, you know, obviously, uh, from my perspective, this past year, there has been uh, more conversation and activity surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion than in my entire life in our field. Um, and of course, the big question is, will that hold? Will things actually systemically change, et cetera? So curious kind of in the work that you're doing, um, what are any key things that uh, our audience should know about who might want to replicate or potentially partner or collaborate with work that you're doing? Um, um, so, but separate from that broader question, um, I wanted to, you mentioned that for a number of your students or for all of your students that they are involved and exposed to the repertoire that you have where you're engaging with composers or composition repertoire by, uh, by composers of color. And uh, which is phenomenal. And I know a lot of institutions kind of dabble do one thing or another, but they don't necessarily have something where all of their students are doing it. So could you just kind of share a little about that? And was there any pushback? Do you find value in that? Because looking at many institutions that don't necessarily have a program like that, um, what would you share about its value? I think education is key, making sure that that your students and your faculty are aware of the music that's out there and that the mandate is not simply to perform a piece by a composer of color, but to actually know what those pieces are and be able to select which ones are the pieces that you really like. Uh, take the time to fall in love with those works and then program them and then teach them in your lessons. So 
uh, we've we've gone on an exploration at Juilliard with our faculty to to say listen to a lot of different works of of composers of color and select not just any pieces but the ones that really speak to you and let's create a list of those and then let's share those with the, with our students because a lot of students oftentimes follow what the faculty recommend that they do and if a student walks into a lesson and their teacher is thinking I just heard this really wonderful piece by whoever, by Tanya Leon or Gabrielle Elena Frank or whatever. And I think that you should learn this piece that's really wonderful and you should program it on your recital and I'm gonna teach it. Uh, for example, there's a there's a cello work by Allison Loggins Hall that one of our teachers has been teaching to all of her students in her studio uh, because she's excited about, about that work. Not because we need to perform music by a black composer, but because this is a great piece of music that deserves to, to be given attention. Uh, so I think really the conversation is largely about framing and then making sure that those pieces are not done as a one-off thing, but there's, there's regularity. You know, we're not going to do this this year. We're doing something for black composers or this year we're doing something for female composers, but this is just a part of the way that we do business. I absolutely love it. And, uh, and of course that was my own experience went into a lesson one day with my teacher at Michigan and he was like, do you want to play William Grant still? And I was like, who? <laughs> and, uh, and then it began a journey from there. Uh, so I think that's so powerful, especially about the idea that it's still, it's about the work, it's about the art, it's about the music and its excellence, um, as opposed to just do this because it's a, a composer of color. Um, when we kind of step back right to the broader aspect of, of DE&I, right, this kind of cuts across not just the works that we're performing, but also the environment in which students of color find themselves and whether they feel that they're welcomed and they're part of an environment or whether it goes to recruitment and faculty, so on and so forth. Are there any kind of key things that you've either been involved with there at Juilliard or in the field broadly, because you're really a leader across the field, obviously beyond your own institution, um, that you think would be of importance or that you think is one of the key things either going on or that people should be thinking about as they think about DE&I and their own institutions? There, there are so many things. <laughs> we, you know, at Juilliard, we have an EDIB task force that meets really regularly. Uh, we've been creating language for, for bias response for students within the institution. Um, from a repertoire standpoint, I talked a little bit about what we're doing in that space. Um, what we're doing with the curriculum is, is really important as far as what classes we offer, uh, who teaches those classes, the different guest artists that we have that are speaking to our students. It's really, it's really about a very comprehensive view of making this happen. I think oftentimes we get caught on very singular things like, did we play enough pieces by female composers this year? But it's really not just what you play, but who teaches, who they're teaching, <laughs> how they're teaching, all of those things, and it's it's really about those things add up to to an overarching sense of culture and and belonging. So we really have our eye on all of those things, and we keep our expectations very very high. Uh, we don't we don't lower expectations for certain people and raise them for others. We believe that everyone's capable of everything, uh, and we approach our work with with love, which I think is, you know, in some ways sounds a little a little cute or something, but I think that's really the bottom line is, is one of the ways that you reach people is that you love them. You know, and if, if you, as a leader, I think one of the keys is actually loving the people that you serve. When you stand in front of your students, you stand in front of their parents and you talk about the work that they're going to do when you hear them, do you really care about these people and their experience that they're enjoying themselves and that they, they feel like they belong in your space, that the space you're creating is one that's that's not just one where they're accepted, but one where they really want to be there and they feel good about it. You know, I don't want students to to want to come to Juilliard just because the name on the front of the building is Juilliard. I want them to come to Juilliard because they feel like Juilliard is doing something that excites me and makes me feel like I belong in that space and I can have a good time and I can be challenged and all of those things and I'm going to fit right in when I go there. Um, and that's, that's a lot of different puzzle pieces. So that's the educational space. Of course, you're, you're aware of the, the SOPA uh, auditions that we did this year, the excerpt competition, which I think is a huge move in the right direction. And I'm really, I'm really excited about those 70 plus orchestras that partnered and have decided to guarantee work to, to uh, musicians, uh, this musicians of color, this upcoming season. I think that's a huge, 
a huge move. I can't wait to see all of these these faces gracing the stages of professional orchestras next year. So there's there's a lot of things going on. Awesome. awesome. Well, it's incredible work and incredible body and breadth of work uh, that you are leading. Unfortunately, we're just about out of time, but I always like to ask because with all of this work, I'm sure there are days where there are either challenges that arise or anything where you just otherwise might feel like this is too much or this is too hard, but there's sources of inspiration that you're able to tap into. And curious, where do you go or what do you draw on for strength, for um, inspiration when times are the hardest? Whew, that, that's a great question. You know, it's, I think it's, I think it's the mission. You know, this, this is not, this work is not about me or how tired I am or how energetic I am. It's about the fact that the work needs to get done. Um, and there's a joy in being, being a part of that. Um, for some reason that just energizes me. I think when you love what you do, you fatigue is an afterthought. Um, and I, I'll tell you one quick story. I remember years ago, Fabio Luisi, who's one of my absolute favorite conductors, uh, a couple of other conductors had gotten sick or were injured and he had to conduct six operas in one week at the Mint. I think he was doing the entire ring cycle plus La Cenerentola and something else. And we had gotten to a uh, Saturday evening uh, and Saturdays at the Met are a double day where you have an afternoon and then an evening performance. And so we're right before act three of God or Dem Room. So like, you know, coming up on the end of a 10 hour day, he's been conducting on the podium all day. And I walk into the pit and he's standing there. And I said, Maestro, you know, if we did Cenerentola earlier today and Turin Dot last night, and now we're in, into the fifth and sixth hours of God or Dem Room, he said, you must be tired. And he looked me right in the face and he said, I'm not. <laughs> and, wow. and I thought that's, and I don't know if he was telling the truth or not, but, but, but I really, I admired the mindset. It's like, we are here to do work at the highest level and make a difference and, and make a difference in other people's lives. We don't have time to talk about being tired. Weston Spratt, you truly are one of the great arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again.